Good morning, Victory Church. Please stand up and worship with us. Good morning, y'all. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Um, if y'all bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, we're so excited to be in your presence this morning. And we're so glad that your presence is the only thing in our lives that really creates freedom and really allows us to, to open up and to be vulnerable because your grace and the arms that you open wide to welcome us back home every single week, every single day, every single minute, they're the most unfailing grace that we have the privilege of experiencing, God. And I'm so glad that um, all of us can come together on Sunday mornings, even with everything that goes on in the world and everything that goes on in our personal lives, God, that we can join you here in person and here online, God. And we can just, just breathe and rest for a moment in the vulnerability that you allow us to feel, God. So um, just allow your presence to fall on this place and to fall on these next few minutes of worship and to fall on the, the message brought by Pastor Haley this morning, God. 
We love you so much. Amen.
dark winters bowing here the farmhouse without you love for the poor you're the one that guides my heart and you oh Comes my way, and I cannot stand up for on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. telling you, the, the more that goes on in this world, the more I realize just how desperately I need him. Every hour, every minute, every moment, I need him. And what's so amazing about our God is that he's not a God who stands over and lords over us from afar, but he is so very present in a moment. In a moment when we cry out to him, he is so very near to us. Ever-present help in the time of trouble. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to share something with you. You can stay standing for just a moment. And you, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now works in the sons of obedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. This is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you he made alive 
who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Who were dead. I want you everybody to say generous. Generous. Let's keep going. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Say that again. Say generous. By grace you have been saved and raised up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Say it again. Say generous. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The gift of God. Not of works. That means you can't earn it lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Say generous, that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. If there's any question on what I'm going to be teaching and preaching on today, there it's probably been summed up by now, but this is a DNA moment here at Victory Church. It's a DNA moment, and we're going to be talking about generosity. Now, I don't want to lose you. I know there's some visitors here this morning, and you're thinking, she's getting up there after Easter, new folks here, and she's going to talk about generosity. She's coming to get our money. I promise you that's not what this is about. Just stay with me, okay? This is not what you think it is. You hear me? Let's bow our hearts, bow our heads. Father, we are so thankful for your overwhelming generosity that when we were dead in our trespasses, that Christ died for us. Generous is the only word that I can use to describe you, Father. It wasn't because I earned it. It wasn't because I was good enough. Because the truth is I can never be good enough. But it was because of your great love. Because you are rich in mercy, Lord, and oh, so generous. Father, I pray that whatever shortcomings that I may have this morning, any confusion or inability to express the word that you put on my heart, Lord, I just pray that you would just overcome that. Lord, and just that you would plant seeds down in the hearts of your people that will bear fruit for years. Lord, you are a generous God, and because of that, we are called to be a generous people. Father, let your anointing rest. Let the, bro let the yokes be broken. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I just want to take a moment and welcome you to Victory Church. I'm Pastor Haley Bryant. I'm the children's pastor here. Pastor Michael asked me to, to come up here and, and deliver a DNA moment. And so just to take a moment of your time and explain what that is. See, there are some things that are in our DNA here at Victory Church. There are things that are just quintessentially us because of the vision, because of the mission that God has called us to, to here in the Delta. There are some things about us, characteristics, attributes, principles, whatever you want to call them, that are essential to who we are as Victory Church, and generosity is one of those things. But really, let's be honest, it's not just part of Victory's DNA, but as believers, as followers of Christ, as ambassadors who represent Him to the rest of the world, it's really a part of every believer's DNA because that's the example that we see set in God through Christ, right? And so this morning, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about generosity and like I said, I don't think it's about what you think it's about, okay? I'm not standing up here like those TV preachers begging for money with the offering plates. We're not going through some big giving campaign where I'm asking you to commit so much to this ministry. That's not what this is because in reality, we don't see that in Scripture. We don't see a God who's begging like, like a poor man on the side of the road, please, sir, can I have some more? We don't see that in Scripture. We see a God of abundance and a God of blessing, but we also see a God who says, I don't want you to make this an idol. You hear me? So I'm going to ask something of you. But we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But let me just promise you, I'm not up here to collect your offering and your tithe. That's not what this is about. Because 
Here's something that we're going to see in Scripture, and this is my one thing, to borrow this from Pastor Michael, this, this idea. My one thing is this. We'll see this over and over again. The biblical principle of generosity has less to do with our money and more to do with our heart. It has less to do with how much you give on a Sunday or if you give on a Sunday and more to do with are you living a life of generosity in all that you do? Are you giving of your time to others? When someone is in need, do you step in to meet that need, whether it's maybe a financial need or maybe it's just they need a friend and someone that they can talk to on a regular basis? Do you hear me? Because time Giving of yourself and of your time is living generously. And that has nothing to do with our pocketbooks. So we're going to see this over and over again in Scripture. It's not about our money, guys. It's about a heart issue. Are we a generous people? See, God has called a people to himself that are meant to be set apart. They're meant to be different from the world around them. And one of the ways that he does this is in our giving. Are we a generous people to the point that others take notice? Do they say, there's something different about that people. There's something different about those, those individuals. They're not like everybody else. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to look at what the Bible has to say about generosity, not in our financial giving, but in our lives. Just being a generous people with our lives. And we're coming off of Easter and such a powerful service last week, such an amazing Easter season where we're reminded of the sacrifice that Christ made for us, that God made for us in Christ, and then the power of of that resurrection Sunday where he rose again that death did not conquer him the grave did not conquer him but he rose again such a blessing to be reminded of that it's the cornerstone of our faith and so here we are and we're talking about generosity and I can't think of a more powerful scripture more poignant scripture than one that's at the very heart of our faith please say it with me if you know it John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In this scripture alone, this scripture alone proves my point that it's not about our money. God gave his son. Financially cost him nothing but cost him everything. And as a parent now, I cannot wrap my mind around a God who would sacrifice his child, spotless, blameless, perfect child, for a people who are so rebellious and so sinful and so often go their own way and just do what they want to do. I cannot wrap my mind around it. But that's what we see. For God so loved the world that he gave. When Pastor Michael and I were talking through this, this series or this message, he, he quoted, um, he shared a quote with me, and I've heard it over the years, and it's attributed to different authors, but I'll share it with you again because I think it just rings so true. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And I've seen this attributed to different authors over the years, Robert Louis Stevenson, Amy Carmichael, Victor Hugo, I'm really not sure where it originated, but I think you get the sentiment, right? I think we all understand that in this world today, people give all the time. Philanthropists make a career out of giving their wealth away to other people for different reasons, whatever the motivation may be. Maybe it's power, maybe it's fame and attention, they want to look good, or let's be honest, the self-satisfaction because it does feel good to give. Whatever the motivation may be, people give for different reasons. But the truth is, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. The two are synonymous. They go hand in hand. And I just can't think of a greater scripture that sums this up than John 3.16. And like I said, what we see here is that, that giving really is not just about a dollar amount. And I want to go to my first point. Let's just jump in here. God has given us all time, talents, and treasures that he wants to use for his glory. 
every single one of us in here have been given the same 24 hours in a day. No one is, gets special favor. There's no stepchild in that, you know, in that equation. No one gets special favor. We all get the same 24 hours in the day. God gives us all certain abilities or talents that sometimes it's unique to you as an individual. Other people don't have. And then as far as treasures go, all of us in here have accumulated some, some may be smaller than others, right? But some type of treasure, whether it's through your job and the pay that you've received or possessions that you've accumulated, all of us have accumulated some type of treasure. But you know what? God wants us to use it for his glory. Let's go to Romans. And let's just dive right in here. It says, so in Christ... We, though many form one body and each member belong to all the others, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Say that. Say, I have a gift. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy do it cheerfully the translation that they put up in the first service and i'm kind of glad they did it says if it's to extend kindness that's a gift that's a gift to extend kindness then do it cheerfully so when we read through this passage and we see the list of all of these gifts really only one of them has anything to do with finances did you notice that only one of them has anything to do with your pocketbook all the rest of these talk about our time and our abilities because God has given all of us some abilities that are meant to be used for others. What Paul is saying here is that we are not to hold on to these gifts for ourselves and store them up for ourselves, but they are meant to be used to be exhausted at the benefit and the blessing of other people. Because generosity is really less about money and it's more about our hearts. Are you living a generous life? Do you live only for yourself and what you can gain, or do you spend time in the service of others, helping to bless others in, with the gifts that God has given you to benefit someone else? Are you living generously? You have to take note of that, something to think about. It means that we're generous with our words. Look at verse 8. It says, if it is to encourage, then to give encouragement. Have you ever even thought about generosity in that context? That we could be generous with our words, with our compassion. It means we don't jump to conclusions and assume the worst. Hello. If I'm honest, I don't want to hear an amen from my husband. You say nothing. Nothing. <laughs> if I'm honest I, and I, if I'm truthful, this has been so hard for me this week, this message. Because God has like kicked me in the stomach over some of this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, when you think it's going to be easy, I can get up there and talk about generosity. I even told my husband, this will be a breeze. I can get up there and talk about generosity. And then God started to deal with me. Because, yeah, we may be generous with finances and with time and other things, but how am I when it comes to my criticism? I, I think this week, if I'm honest, I would say I've probably been pretty generous with being critical. I've probably been pretty generous with making assumptions. You hear me? With second guessing people's motives, I've probably been pretty generous with that. With my frustration, because my patient level has been my patience level has been so low, I've probably been pretty generous with my frustrations. That's not the kind of gifts that we're supposed to spread around. Anybody else? If they're honest, thank you. I know I'm not the only one. I saw those mama hands go straight up, like those two mamas right here in the front. The, the third, I understand. I understand. I get it. And I'm kind of encouraged that I'm not alone. So thank you for using your gift of encouragement, being honest. <laughs> but we all struggle with it. We all suffer with it. And so I've been convicted this week. I'm up here talking about generosity, but have I been generous with my mercy? Have I been generous with my kindness and my encouragement? Hmm. Some things to think about. God has been so generous to us. He's given us these gifts. Who are we to withhold? Who are we to keep them to ourselves? But he wants us to use them to bless his people. And in turn, we're going to see how it blesses him. 
I'll just share. I want to I wanna put some skin on this, bring this into context and make it real for you. Because when we're talking about abilities and we're talking about time, we're not just talking about what's, what happens here in the church. Because if you've come to Victory for any length of time, you've heard us say over and over again, this is not the church. We are the church. This is just meant to kind of be that little pep talk, right? This is just meant to be that little... Uh, what do you call that huddle before the game? What happens in your lives in the real world? You are the church meant to spread the gospel, the good news, the love of Jesus with whoever you're around doing whatever you do. Okay? So I want to put some skin on this just to give you a couple of examples of some situations that I know of where people are using their time or their talents or their treasures to bless others and build up the kingdom. There's a young lady that goes here, attends our services. She's at home with a new, a brand new baby, baby right now. Shelby Jo Moore, Shelby Jo Flinner, you may know her as. Um, but Shelby Jo is a very gifted athlete. And in fact, she got a scholarship to Ole Miss for playing softball when she got out of high school. And so, very gifted athlete. And when she returned home back to Crittenden County, God gave her a, a, maybe a heart for something in this community, something different, an opportunity for something different for the kids in this community, using the gifts that she was given to play sports. God can use that? Absolutely he can. Absolutely. That's an ability. That's a talent. Using the gifts that she was given, she started a branch of the Miracle League right here in Crittenden County. And if you're not familiar with that, it provides opportunities for kids with special needs to play sports, to get together with other kids and to play sports. What an amazing example of generosity, using her time and her talents to bless others. One of our very own, I don't know if she's here this morning, but Miss Amber Tackett, I have to share this. Amber is a gifted decorator, and she's very gifted at what she does. She has an eye for those things. She has a, a desire, a heart for it. And she approached us several years ago when we were working toward getting our vacation Bible school ready. She said, you know, I'm interested in this. I think I could do a good job at it. Why don't you, why don't you let me take over the decorations? Why don't you let me handle that, that up? Bless her. She was working with me, so that's a, whole, that's a whole nother level of generosity on her part and the compassion and kindness she had to show. But Amber took over for our uh, decorating team for VBS and has headed that up every year. And not only does she give of her talents and time, she, she makes sure she'll reach out to me months in advance and say, okay, when's VBS so I can schedule time off? Like she takes time off of work so that she could be available just for that. Do you hear me? What a blessing and what a way to use your talents to bless the people of God. She helps to create, completely create the environment in here so when those kids walk in, those eyes, and they are so excited over everything that's going on. It just adds to that excitement, which adds to that experience for the week of Vacation Bible School. Do you hear me? These are just some examples. But generosity has less to do with your money and more to do with your heart. Are you living open-handed and open-hearted? Do you store up for yourselves, or do you use the abilities and gifts that God has given you for others? That's generosity. That's generosity. Number two, through our generosity, we get to bless God. And as a lover of Christ, that's something that gets me excited to know that I have the ability to bless the Lord, to put a smile on his face, to bring him a little joy. That blesses me. Listen to this passage in Matthew. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. Listen, I was sick and you visited me. That doesn't cost a thing, does it? Just your time. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick in prison and visit you? Then the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. When we extend generosity to others in the way of 
feeding them, clothing them, opening our hearts and our homes to them, visiting the sick. We're doing it unto the Lord. When we're giving with no expectation of giving in return, but because we recognize that we have been given so freely, we are blessing the Lord. I don't know, that just there's something about that that just kind of stirs up my heart a little bit. And I'm thankful for an opportunity to get to bless my father because there's no way I could ever repay him for the debt that he paid for me. And when we understand that, and then we know we get to be a part of blessing him. Come on. Something powerful about that. Something powerful about that. Number three. Listen, I, I don't want to stand up here and act like it's, it's easy because generosity will cost you something. No, no pun intended there. <laughs> but it will cost you something. Your time, your energy, maybe finances, but it will cost you something. I want to go to a passage in the Old Testament. I love this story. Just to give you a little bit of a... You can put the um, point back up there. I'll come to the scripture in just a minute. Thank you. Just to give you a little background here, God's people had been rebellious and there was judgment for their behavior. We see that a lot of times in the Old Testament, kind of an up and down where God's people are rebellious, there's judgment, they repent, they love the Lord, they fall back into a season where they're rebellious, there's God's mercy extends and then he says, you know what, my judgment will go forth and there's judgment. We see that a lot, up and down. And I think it really is just probably a picture of us, isn't it? Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> because you can still love the Lord and be rebellious at times. I can love the Lord and then at times my, my selfishness starts to show through and I have to repent. I can love the Lord and at times maybe lose sight of who I am in Christ. You hear me? Such a picture of us. We see that in the Old Testament. And what we also see is God extends his mercy over and over. He doesn't just wipe them all out and start over. Aren't you thankful for that? But he extends his mercy, and through Christ, he made it all right. So in this passage, God's people had been rebellious, and there's a drought in the land. And so what we know historically, scientifically, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, is that when the water dries up, and there's no water, the plants don't grow. So when the plants don't grow, the animals can't eat. Animals can't eat, the animals die. So not only is there a drought where the water has dried up, but because of that, there's a famine. There's hunger that's permeating the land. And God sends his prophet Elijah to this city, Zarephath, and he says, I want you to go to this city, and I want you to find this widow. I've got a plan laid out for you here. I want you to find this widow. And it says, so he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And then he said, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. And as she was going to bring it, go on to the next one. I think it's verse 12. No, verse 11. Sorry. As she was going to get it, he called, bring me, please, a piece of bread. Yeah, there we go. Verse 12, it says, And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. That's all I have left. This is what this famine, this is what this drought has cost me. This is all I have left. She says, And now I'm gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. They're destitute. They're completely without. This is it. They're on the edge of, of destruction, really. She says, this is it. I, I, you found me out here gathering some sticks so I could go make a fire, bake a cake, and my son and I could die. This is the end for us. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first. Everybody say, but first. Make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. Stay right here. Go back for a minute. But first, he said, I hear you. I know what you're going to do, but before you take care of yourself, I want you to make me a little cake and bring it to me. But first, that, that's a whole message right there. I mean, <laughs> but first. I put myself in this woman's shoes. I don't know if it's right for me to do that or not, but I think about her state of mind in that moment. 
This is all they had left. She had already made up her mind, this is it, we're going to die. We're going to starve to death. So I think about that, and that woman, where she's at, in that, that frame of mind. And the man of God comes to her and says, I hear what you're saying, but before you take care of yourself, I want you to go and I want you to prepare something for me. Now my mama heart, you know, mama bear comes up and is like, what you mean you want me to feed you before I feed my kids? Like, what do you mean? Come on. Listen to what Elijah says. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and she did as Elijah said and she and her household ate for many days. Can we give God praise for that? The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Generosity is going to cost you something. There's some things I want to take note of here. The first one is I want you to pay attention to her obedience because she had a choice in that moment. When the man of God came to her and said, but first, she could have walked away in disgust angered by what was being asked of her, what do you mean you want me to take care of you while my child is starving to death? She could have, but instead she chose obedience to what the man of the Lord was saying. So in her obedience we see that not only did she give, but there was sacrificial giving. This is giving that cost her something. Do you hear me? Obedience will cost you something, but you're going to see in just a minute the benefits far outweigh what God requires of us. Over and over again, I've seen it in my own life, how God has asked me to do something and I've stepped out in obedience and then he has blown my mind with how he has, I don't even want to say return the favor or repaid it because he, it's not a cosmic slot machine. Do you understand me? It's not, you know, well, I do this and it's a guarantee that God will do this. We don't, we don't operate all that. It doesn't work that way. I don't give out of an expectation of getting. I give because I have a, a, just a revelation of God's great mercy and grace and love and blessings on my life, and I can't help but to give. Do you understand? But I've seen it time and time again where I've been obedient and I've been faithful and maybe you know even given sacrificially at different seasons, and God has just blown my mind. I didn't share this in the first service, but I told the Lord, that if given the opportunity, I would share this. You know, my husband and I, we have two little babies. We've had two kids in the last two years. What in the world? <sighs> yeah, not our idea. Not our idea. The Lord has other plans at times. And, you know, having kids is expensive. Like, it costs money. You, is anybody surprised by that, or was it just me? When you start to get those hospital bills, you mean I got to pay for this? Like, it costs money to have children. And so the way it works, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I don't want to take too much of your time on this, but, but when, when you go to the doctor and, whoo, you're having a baby, they start you right away on making those payments. You've got to pay that doctor. And so the way it worked is you pay the doctor's portion before the baby, and then after the child is born, you pay the hospital portion and whatever else is left. So if you had anesthesia, if you had a, an epidural, you got to pay for it. And then there's a pediatrician that comes and checks on that baby, you know, for five minutes over two days. So you got to pay for it, right? And so we start paying for that part after. So we, you know, we had Georgia, doctor's good, we're paying all the hospital stuff, and then, woohoo, going to have another baby. So the cycle starts all over again. And so when all is said and done, and I, I'm, like I said, I don't want to take too much of your time, it's expensive to have children. Even with good insurance, it's expensive to have children. It's a blessing, but they're an expensive blessing. And so all was said and done, you know, I mean, I would say between the two, we probably had about fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, you know, just in hospital medical bills. And, and you know, we paid stuff. But when it, after Judah's born, we, we're, we still have about eight or 9000 that you're, paying on so Judah's born, we get the bill, hmm, the bill, and so we, I go in, I set up the portal to pay everything, you know, and, 
and we're, we're paying on stuff. And about two months into it, I go to make the payment. I get a notice. That's what it was. I got a notice saying you have an update in your account. Oh, Lord, they found some hidden charge. I took two time all they didn't know about. It's another $700. <laughs> you know, right? Come on. So I go into the portal, and it says zero balance. I said, huh? And I called my husband. I'm like, something's not right. Like, they're coming for us. I don't know, baby. I don't know. I've been paying. I don't know. <laughs> they're coming to take him back. <laughs> Repoing the baby. <laughs> And so I, I called the accounts people, and, you know, I get on the phone with an actual person. And I said, okay, I, I'm going, you know, we've set up all these payment options and we're paying, you know, my baby was born two months ago, but when I logged in today, it said I had a zero balance. Yes, ma'am, your balance is zero. Okay, but, you know, like two days ago, it was like $8,000. So we're, you know, what's going on here? Well, it's a zero balance, ma'am. Right? I get that. <laughs> but it wasn't, you know. So what, what happened to where what happened to it? And she said, well, your insurance, you know, we settle with the insurance when you have a baby. And then whatever's left, you know, we, your, your insurance pays a certain portion. And then whatever's left, the balance remaining, you pay. Well, the hospital has decided to, what was the word they used? To write off this balance. Yes. <laughs> Scared me, Pastor. I said, excuse me? I said, what do you mean write off the balance? And she said, well, we do that sometimes where we just, you know, we write off. The insurance settles and what's left, we just write it off. So what does that mean to me, though? Like, are you going to come back to me in a week and say, you owe this and because you were late, you know, 24 hours? I don't know, you know. And I said, so what, is, what does that mean? She said, well, you have a zero balance. <laughs> okay, I hear what you're saying. But what happened to the money? And she said, well, with COVID and everything that's gone on, we realize that it's been a hardship for parents. And so periodically the hospital will go through and cancel out remaining balances and pay off and cancel the debt that's owed. Y'all, I called that hospital three more times to just to make sure I heard what I heard. What do you mean there's no zero balance? I had to talk to somebody different in case they had access to the account that somebody didn't know about. What, what do you mean there's zero balance? Well, you have a zero balance, ma'am. The Lord in his goodness. Now, look, I'm not telling you it's all about the money, and God's not a cosmic slot machine. I promise you that. But we do see that principle in his word over and over again. There is the principle of reaping and sowing. And what you sow repeatedly, you will reap. And I can tell you, my husband and I, you know, we may not have always been able to give the most, but we've always given consistently. And there have been seasons where we have sacrificially given of our time or of our, you know what I'm saying, or of our finances. And God has repaid that in full over and over again but not just with finances because praise god when you get a zero balance hospital bill hallelujah you know not just in finances there are so many times in my life where something happens i whisper a prayer to the lord just an inkling of a thought of a man i wish you know lord it'd be really good if and before i know it i get a call about something working out in our favor, some opportunity opening itself, some door that we're able to walk through that has nothing to do with finances, but all because of God's goodness, just a desire, a hidden desire that God saw and met that need or blessed. Do you hear me? Let me go to the next one because what's amazing, well, hold on. What's amazing about this is because of her obedience and her sacrificial giving, the Lord's faithfulness is shown. And it says the jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord. That means every day she went into her pantry during that drought and she went to check her oil. It had risen up again from the day before. And she went to scoop up that flour. It had risen up again and she made that cake and there's nothing left. And then the next day, she goes back to that pantry and that jug has filled up again and that vat of flour has risen again and she goes to make that cake every day they were provided for because of her obedience and her sacrificial giving unto the Lord thank you sir but it
it does not end there. And this is what I really want to stress to you, and this is my next point. God's blessings go way beyond the monetary and the materialistic. It's not just about money. It's not because God's blessings extend so far beyond that. Listen to what happens. Like, go back for a minute. I don't want to reveal too much too soon. I'm going to tell you what happens. They're provided for. They're taken care of. And every day, every day there's enough in the jar and enough in the vat of flour to meet their needs. And every day they go back. And there's enough to meet their needs. God promises that until this drought is over, you will be taken care of. Not just you, but the man of God will be taken care of. And so we see that sometime later, something has happened in the course of, of this family's history. Something has happened where we see that her son, the young man that she was going to build a cake for and die with, we see that her son falls ill. And the Bible doesn't tell us what happened. It just says that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And the illness was so severe, it says that there was no breath in him. He passes. He passes. And she says to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? Like, even in her doubt, God is faithful. Hear me? Even in her questioning God is faithful. She says, what have you against me, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. Listen what Elijah says. He says, give me your son. And he took him from her arms, carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Even Elijah, the man of God, is questioning like, what's going on, Lord? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times, and he cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. Three times. And it says, And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. I wonder how many times the blessings of God in my life look like being spared from a car accident. Do you hear me? Or, or not falling prey to an illness. Maybe that's what the blessing of God looks like. It has nothing to do with money, has nothing to do with monetary, but it's all about the other areas, the other ways in which God blesses us that we have no idea. I think about countless stories I know of young ladies who were told you'll never be able to have a child, and now they're looking at their second or third baby. Do you understand me? The blessings of God go far beyond the materialistic and the monetary. Far beyond. God's watching. God's listening. He sees your generosity. He sees all the time that you're devoting to that situation. He sees the way that you give of yourself in that area or the way that financially maybe that you're blessing some ministry or some opportunity and it's costing you something. God sees that. And I just want to remind you that his blessings may not be materialistic, but there are ways that he is blessing you. Amen. Let's not forget the greatest show of generosity. I want to go back to Ephesians, what we read from in the beginning, because I want to remind you, if this isn't generous, I don't know what is. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved, and he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. Jesus. Can we say generous? Generous. So generous. See, the biggest factor in determining our ability or our need to be generous is understanding the generosity shown to us. When we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive in Christ. The greatest example of generosity is the generosity that was shown when Christ hung on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And when that's down in you, when you understand that, that's a part of your DNA, you can't help but to be generous. It just comes out of you. You can't help it. We start to give like we've never given before. 
we look for opportunities to serve and to bless others. Like we're on the hunt. What can I do to help you? What can I do to help you? How can I plug in here and bless somebody else? God reveals gifts and abilities in us, and we start searching out ways that we can use those to bless other people, to advance his kingdom. I think that, that the times that we lose sight of this, it's, it's because we're having an identity crisis. You hear me? It's because we've, we've lost track of who we are. And so sometimes we need a reminder. And I will say, I, I feel, and I'm probably going to get some mad faces at this, but I'm just going to say it. But I, I feel like this last season, this year and a half that we've been through with all of the political upheaval and with all of the, with everything that's happened with COVID and the isolation, I, I feel like that's gone a long way and maybe causing us to maybe forget a little bit of our identity when it comes to generosity. Hear me out on this, okay? Hear me out on this. I, I think all of the news reports, the medical reports that we're hearing that say stay away from people, keep your distance, I, I think it's done some damage in the fact that it causes us to look at everybody as a threat. You hear what I'm saying? We start to look at people not as image bearers, but as a threat to what they could do to us. I got to stay away. I got to keep my distance. They could infect me. They could infect my family. Do you hear me? I'm not knocking the science, and I think maybe for a season, a season, but I wonder how much of it has carried over and gone on too far to now where we keep our distance and we're closed off from folks when God is calling us to be open-handed and open-hearted. Do you hear me? Now, it may mean that we need to get creative in how we do that, but, but I, I think it's just gone on so long that now we got a people who stand back and instead of diving in to help and to give and to be available and to open their homes and to go to the prison to visit the, you know, the prisoners or to visit the ill, they stand back and they say, from afar, praying for you. But they're not being the hands and feet anymore. You hear what I'm saying? Don't, don't give me the sad faces on Facebook. It's just my opinion. Do what you will with it. I will say... What unsettles me, I think about some of this stuff, is that when I read about the life of Christ and I study in Scripture the example that he set, I don't see Christ running from the religious police. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see him backing down from the miracles, the blessings. I see him continually going to the temple, even though he knew that religious leaders were out to kill him once they got to a certain point in his ministry. He continued to visit the temples because he was about his father's business and not about self-preservation. I did say that out loud, didn't I? I don't know, just my thoughts on these things. So for a season, maybe, maybe it's time Maybe it's time to open ourselves back up and be the generous people that God has called us to. Because it does cost you something. It costs this widow everything. But oh, the blessings in return. Oh, the amazing blessings in return. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. When we were dead in our trespasses, when we could do nothing to save ourselves, and even still on our best days can do nothing to save ourselves. He became the sacrifice, paid the debt for us. That's generosity. So then who am I to withhold it from other people? And the example is so clearly set for me to live beyond myself and in the service of God and others. bow our heads and go to the Lord for prayer. I just desperately pray that if you've never crossed that line of faith, if you hear me up here talking and it just seems like gibberish, what do you mean I can't earn God's favor? What do you mean I can't be good enough? We can't. We can never be good enough in our own selves to earn our salvation. There's not some cosmic checklist where if I do A, B, and C, then I'm going to get into heaven. It doesn't work that way. It says, 
By grace we are saved, lest anyone should boast. By grace, it's a free gift. All you have to do is accept it. Recognize that Christ died on the cross for your sins. And then ask him to be Lord of your life. That just means to stop living for yourself. Stop trying to do it all, control it all, be it all yourself, and let Christ be Lord. Because, I mean, there's something I've learned over the years is that he does a lot better job at being Lord of my life than I ever could. Father, if there is anyone in here who feels that tug, Lord, I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're there with open arms, ready to forgive, ready to adopt in to the family of faith. When we profess Jesus as Lord, we're no longer slaves and servants, but we are sons and daughters of the Most High. And all that's associated with that, that means all the privilege, all the blessing is yours. The access, free access to the King. Father, I thank you for that. What an amazing gift. How generous you are. How generous. We bless your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. That was such a good word, Pastor Haley. Thank you so much. We're so happy all of you could join us today. If you are a first-time guest, we have a little gift to say thank you for coming. If you will, just fill out the Connect card in the back of your chair and give it to a greeter in the lobby. They'll give you a gift. Um, this upcoming Saturday, our youth group, Wired Youth, is heading to Greenbrier, Arkansas for Youth Fest. It is April 17th, Saturday, and uh, the cost is $10, and we need you to fill out a permission slip if you want to go. So if you'll stop at the table to come see me or Kayla, and we're going to give you some info, and you can sign up. Ladies, Victory Chicks is back April 18th, Sunday, at 5 p.m. We're going to have a guest speaker, Miss. Naya Marion from Families in Transition. And if you want to get any more information on that, you can stop and talk to Miss Carla Smith about it. And we also have our graduate wall coming up for all of our 2021 graduates. So if you've been coming to Victory for a while and you're graduating this year, make sure you email Miss Heather at heathers at victorywire.com and she's going to put you on the list so that you can go on the wall and we can bless y'all and help send y'all off to school. And then our last act of worship is giving tithes and his offerings. And so um, we have a few ways you can do that. If you want to drop an envelope in the bucket on your way out, you can do that. Or you can do our text to give, and that number is 870-394-5990. And then you can also mail it in if you'd like. And that address is P.O. Box 1082, um, West Memphis, Arkansas, 72303. And you can also give it victorywire.com. Thank y'all. Have a good week.